As many of you know, I recently finished my first semester of college at the University of Massachusetts. There, I'm a student athlete playing field hockey. And of course, like most in college, I try to have some fun. I study communications with the hopeful goal of a career in filmmaking. Above all, I learn. I don't necessarily mean classroom learning, but learning from the world around me and the new people around me in this new life experience. Learning is the most important thing we can do for ourselves and the most important thing that we can do for the world. Learning means to think. Learning means to challenge. Learning means allowing yourself to challenge. The most important learning that I have experienced throughout my life has been learning that has involved privilege. Not the kind of privilege that I gain when I slip on my athletics jacket at school or the privilege that's accessible to those in society with positions of prestige. Those are achieved statuses. The privilege I want to discuss is that which comes by way of ascribed statuses. These are the statuses we're marked with at birth, not by our bodies innately, but by body politics and the way that our society today polices us based on misconceptions surrounding nature versus culture. Social constructs then, founded on only certain interpretations of difference, have shaped social hierarchies within categories. They are manifested against the oppressed in both the violent and the nonviolent. There is the abuse, degradation, and discrimination of and against the oppressed, and there is common, everyday, casual prejudice. There are two of the seven UU principles that stand out to me in discussion about privilege. The first is to show justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. The second is the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. I believe that in order to pursue these principles, one needs to understand their social location. Social location is defined by ascribed statuses like gender, race, class, age, ability, religion, sexual orientation, and geographic location. There are four different levels, micro, meso, macro, global. In other words, who you are as an individual in social constructs, and then using that analysis to determine where you fall into hierarchies on the community, national, and international stages. Exploring social location is crucial in being conscious of one's own privilege and lack of privilege and one, has to, and one has to have this kind of awareness in order to understand where others are in relation to you. That is how we become allies to those of different experiences, by understanding ourselves and in turn, listening to others. I'm not going to tell you how or what to think. My goals are simply to encourage understanding, namely the understanding of power structures and the intricacies of privilege. Only through this knowledge can we promote change, as understanding comes from challenging one's own thoughts and all of this is rooted in the desire to learn. A necessary thing to remember about social hierarchies is that they function on, an, on a surface level under binaries or dualisms. Most, if not all, social constructs are founded on the idea that within social categories, there are only two groups, and those two groups are fundamentally different from one another. In other words, they're opposites. They oppose one another. Dualisms are dangerous. They create a power struggle one in, a, one in which one side must come out on top. Within each, there's the oppressor and there's the oppressed. One gains privilege, the other is devalued. Even more, binaries operate within societal systems, actively working against the oppressed. Power structures are institutionalized, and their power comes from everywhere. Not only are binaries dangerous, however, they're false. They take the black and white, the extremes, and everyone who falls into the gray area is marginalized. Therefore, we need to do our best to push those boundaries in discussions like this. If we only fight for or against the extremes, not much is accomplished. There are a lot of reasons why privilege is such an incredibly complex thing. The reality of binaries is one factor. Another is intersectionality. When Social constructs are not separate from one another. They mix, they cross. Our location in each affects our, affects our location in the others. When constructs intersect, an individual's privilege becomes even more complicated. Recognizing and understanding intersectionality is extremely important. When we discuss hierarchy, we need to keep in mind certain ideas about difference. Speaking about difference is tricky. As I, previ as I previously said, hierarchies have been supported through centuries by the promotion of innate difference. Biological determinism 
is a theory that a group's biological and genetic makeup shapes its social, political, and economic destiny. The theory is a way to justify society's branding of certain groups as inferior or superior, whether inferred or outright claimed. The theory of social construction, however, pushes that the claims of, biologic determin of biological determin or determinism are actually defined by people, not genetics, and vary based on different contexts of culture and history. By this, we're saying that there are differences, but they aren't innate. They aren't innate. People themselves invented them. Social constructionism is controversial because it violates historical ideas of nature versus culture. What is taught and what are we born with? Science versus society and nature versus culture are false binaries. Take gender, for example. As Judith Lorber says in the work, Night to His Day, gender is so pervasive in our society that we assume it's spread into our genes. Our society, our institutions, and our systems support the idea that sex and gender are one and the same, rather than recognizing sex as a biological truth and gender as, gender as a social construct related to identity. We internalize socialization so deeply that we don't, notice nor we don't notice norms until one is missing or altered. We, are grow we, we grow up spoon-fed the idea that gender is something that we are, not something that we do. This is body politics. Who dictates what our bodies mean, how they're treated, and how we ourselves treat our bodies? And where does this power come from? Further, idea of what is natural as opposed to what is taught is synonymous with the concept of what is normal and what is abnormal. Continuing with gender, when we, are born, we, we, when we are born, we are told that the body you are born with dictates that you are one of two things, male or female, and so man or woman. This is a lie in itself because if you ask experts at medical centers how often a child is born so noticeably atypical in terms of genitalia that a specialist in sex differentiation is called in, that number comes out to be about 1 in 1,500 to 2,000 births. Intersex children, or people that are born with sexual anatomy, reproductive organs, uh, and or chromosome patterns that don't fit definitions of male or female are proof that binaries, and therefore biological determinism, can't really exist. Not only, though, are we taught that there are strictly two genders, but that there's only one type of man and one type of woman. There's coded rhetoric everywhere in society that normalizes certain bodies and how these bodies should act. These bodies are white. They're cisgendered, which means that you identify with the body that you were assigned to at birth. They're able. They're also straight. In America, to a lot of people, it means that they speak English. I am a woman. I am bisexual. I am cisgendered. I am able. I have enough money, and I'm white. I have been taught by birth, I have been taught since birth that my body does not belong to me. It belongs to the oppressor and the gender hierarchy, men. I've been groomed to fit into a carefully constructed feminine mold, the sexual object, the devalued, is the same way that men have been taught that they are sexual beings, primal but should be more rational, the valued. It affects both, and not in good ways. My sexism is being, called, is being called names for refusing men's advances. It's my gender becoming an insult. It's an older man, a teacher, carefully placing his hand on my lower back and whispering in my ear in the hallway. It's not being able to get angry or frustrated, or frustrated without the person next to me laughing that it must be my time of month. It's being catcalled. You'd be prettier if you smiled. Don't ignore me, just take a compliment. It's being nervous to be alone in an elevator with a man that I do not know. It's cringing at ads in which women's bodies are dismembered and turned into objects for the sake of selling a product. If I ever hold a job in office, people will care more about my pantsuit or lipstick choice than about my actual ideas. At the same time, though, I never need to validate my gender identity for others, never had to decide which public bathroom to use, and I've always been comfortable filling in the bubble that says female on forms. What I do need to validate for others is my sexuality. People love to tell me it's just a phase, and I'm sure there are some people in this room who have gotten that. Girls' bisexuality is not more accepted in the mainstream, like some will argue. It's, main, it's fetished in the mainstream, and acceptance and fetishization are not the same thing. What I will never be is a victim of racism, because I am the one with privilege in the system. My misogyny will never be racialized the way that women of color's misogyny will be. 
Mainstream beauty products are made for my hair and my body, and when I shop, the color nude is meant for white skin. The stress of racism against black women is so extreme that their babies are more likely to be premature, underweight, or have other birth problems. That will never be my reality should I choose to have children. This is where understanding intersectionality is so crucial. In oppression and in privilege, we can't base analysis strictly on normative, ba on normative bodies or on just one single story. That would be trying to explain a novel based only on the first chapter. We can say, we, for example, we can't say that women make 77 cents to a man's dollar. We can't say that white women do. Failing to raise the point that black women make 63 cents and Latina women make 54 cents to every man's dollar. Failing, failing to raise that point is failing to address intersectionality, and therefore we are not really addressing the whole spectrum of privilege and oppression. It's commenting on male privilege, of course, but not privilege between different women. That being said, I'm not promoting competition between oppression. All experiences are equally important. It's okay to admit privilege, and it's okay, very okay, to fight against oppression. Both are necessary. They fit together to create a bigger picture and cannot be understood without each other. That is why, to fully realize our social occasions, and therefore our privilege and lack thereof, we need to know where we intersect with others. This is taking social location from the micro to the meso, macro, and global. Only through this challenging of ourselves and our experiences, and how willing we are to listen to others, can we pursue UU principles, equality, and human rights. Then, maybe, we can encourage others to do the same. I challenge you to do so.